I mean, I got, got involved and interested, well, I've been around the IT world all my life, and um, so I got involved in these things. So people expect you to know about it, and then if you're in Parliament, they expect you to know what's going on everywhere internationally and, ev and what's going on in, in the executive. I'm going to say something like that in a moment. But I suppose in the Digital Policy Alliance, which we, there was a sort of rebranding of Europe, the European Informatics Group, uh, we've been looking at things coming out of Europe. And I just want to say something about those very quickly, because we've got those three things around, which have been sort of knocked on the head. And probably, probably people say, oh, thank goodness they've gone away. But, um, and you all know the difference in direct and regulation, of course, which is fine, which is good. Um, so I won't worry you with that. Well, did anyone not know the difference? No, it's very embarrassing out there. But very simple. Directors get transposed into local law. You, the parliament will muck around with it, and so you've got a slightly different interpretation in every country. A regulation is directly applicable in every country in the EU simultaneously when they pass it. Um, and so you've got to be very careful of those, and you've got to be pretty careful of the other because it's going to be different everywhere. So both have got problems. And so thank you for putting your hand up because it gave me that chance to say that. Um, the interesting thing about it is, of course, there are bits of them which are really good. And in fact, if you look at what we've done in, in that cybersecurity strategy document, it is a lot of it is what the NIS director then was trying to get governments to do throughout Europe. The bit where we start stumbling on is when we start sharing, you know, we, you've just heard all about sharing, collaboration, all that sort of stuff. It's when we start doing it internationally. How much of your information do you want going to certain um, ex-Eastern European countries where you might not quite agree with the political stability or the background of the person who heads up some of their policing and security services? And that's where the challenges happen. Because you could just, in collaborating to cure a threat, create a threat. And that's one of the big problems with it. How much information do you get out? Someone pointed out to me the other day that um, the first Tuesday or is it second, whichever it is, update from Microsoft, is a great thing for the hackers. Because they know that people can't patch their systems, and a lot of people, some can't, big organisations can't, you've got to test the patches first, and the small people probably don't get around to applying them, or they're not on automatic updates. So the hackers suddenly have a great manual of all the threats, which they, they've suddenly got a one-week window of opportunity to really, you know, exploit them. So is it a good thing or a bad thing? You know, there, there are a lot of things like that. The DPA regulation, there's lots of good stuff in there. But, you know, the, the right to forgot, be forgotten sort of um, really got worried. You, you can do it. How do you retrospectively get rid of all the backups? If you know it's coming, OK, you can plan how you store stuff. But, and, well, that's a, and I'm going to mention talk about EID in a moment because it, it comes into some other things. Um, anyway, so we've got this great national cyber security strategy, which absolutely... It's the right attitude, I think, to everything. You know, if it's got these four principles about securing all our stuff, you should know them all. And I've gone and put underneath co, because it's all a lot of it's about cooperation, collaboration, partnership. It's about information sharing, getting things together so we can consolidate it. And I started thinking who's involved. Now, I ran out of space, so I stopped putting up TLAs on this side of the thing. Now, you just had a few extra ones here, of which I'd heard of about a quarter, and some were new to me, because I can't keep up in this space. Who can? And the thing that intrigues me about it is, right, so we've got all these people in their fusion cells, and we've got these people liaising between CISP and, what was it, CISERT UK, and da 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 etc. And that's operating at the CERT UK level. Then we've got the Gov CERT, and we've got the Mod CERT, and we've got the da da da, and then we've got the police, etc. You're so busy liaising. How do you have any time to do any work? And all of you commercial organisations, where your board is saying we need to enhance the bottom line, and you say, well, actually, I've got to go off to this meeting somewhere else to learn about all the new stuff, etc. Where are they allocating their resources? Because you eventually get so many people on advisory things. I've given up trying to keep up. I absolutely confess it. I just can't make all the meetings and stay married. It's simple as that. Particularly because there's enough time on the working day, it's quite a lot of them, and I come to a briefing breakfast, come to a briefing dinner, come to a briefing this, that, and the other. So I do my work with my wife, my wife's work, because she's a very good businesswoman herself. She makes much more money than I do. So I help with a lot of backup. And that starts about 11 o'clock at night and finishes uh, this morning at 3 in the morning. And then I had to get up at 7 to get on do the 7.30 train, 7.41 train. And, you know, it's, it's, it, there must be others of you out there with that same problem. Maybe not. You all have nice, relaxing 9 to 5, no pressure, you know, 
Why is it half the world is working overtime and the other half of the work is doing nothing? You know, the world is, and we're supporting the other half. Anyway, talk to Osborne about that one. <laughs> anyway, um, how much time have I got still? All right. I'm on green, say again. Yeah, right. Done. I'm not going to run all of these, but you know, this is how, how do you stay in date? When I first did this off the top of my head, I put action fraud on there. And then I thought, checked up. No, the NFA is still there. I'm wrong. No, but I'm right. It's going at the end of the month. And action fraud will be there. You know, it's trying to keep that up. And the point about this one is we, I put CISP up there as well. Why? Because it's another reporting thing. And we get it, you know, we've got action fraud, which is going to deal with one sort of lot of reporting, being run by the City of London Police with resources from there as a national policing centre. And at the moment, it's going to be, going to be dealing with the, what people see as lower level. But you know, if I want to perpetrate some frauds and I'm nicking a thousand quid a time off people using the internet, I can gear that up quite nicely and probably commit. I don't know, about 5,000 of them a year, quite easily. And as long as I'm cross-county boundary and a bit of international stuff, no one's going to come and do anything about it because it doesn't fall into anyone's jurisdiction. I've just got away with 5 million. Now, if I'm a crime person, I get a few of those networks going, and I'm creaming up, oh, I've got a very nice organisation. So is that why, do you think, every time we get NHTCU or PECQ or something that's going to go after those low-level ones, they roll it into a big agency and change its remit so it can only deal with the big stuff? Well... I can remember as a trained terrorist, the great thing is to attack that weak joint, that weak knuckle, knuckle. You knock out a power station by blowing up the correct pump and things like that. And so, you know, I, I, mean, I heard what you heard, said, said, Chris, and you're absolutely right about dealing with the big stuff. But actually, if I was trying to attack the financial system, I would look at a small place like Northern Rock. You see what I mean? It's, it's not necessarily the domino effect, Lehman Brothers. It wasn't one of the big banks going that triggered these things. It's something small, it's smaller, below the radar. So be careful of that. That's all I'm going to say there, really. Um, and um, anyway, they're very confusing. You're going to have to read about them because um, I haven't got enough time to take you through it. Uh, there's a couple of documents here. You, can, you all know how to use XQuick or Start Page or something that conceals your IP address rather than going into Google. So. Get, get these things up. You'll find them, and it will tell you about the forward plans. It's good stuff. It'll tell you what's going on better than I will, because I'll get it wrong, and then all of you will have to correct me. I'll go around and say he doesn't know what he's talking about, and they're quite right. Uh, now, we had a debate. That's how many minutes? Five. Okay, that's about right. Okay, we had a big debate, actually, the Worshipful Company of Information Technology the other night, and I've seen two people here at least already from that, th three people here. And it's very interesting. And it was about, should we be using technology to protect people more? What could technology do, business do, etc.? Do we do this, that, and that? And it's very interesting. There's a tie at the end of the thing. It started off slightly in favour of technology to do more. We end up with a tie. And the real problem is that we haven't got enough resource um, for, to have the police and people going around protecting people the whole time and the certs and everyone else like that. But on the other hand, so, so they feel that we've got any technology because there's no other option. But on the other hand, it's all about people at the end of the day. And you're never going to cure that problem. So it's a big, big, big difficulty. But the big thing that everyone started talking about was identity. And everyone said, we need to be able to prove who people are the whole time. And we always come back to this argument about identity. And I was one of those people who, with identity cards, I was quite worried about the national database. And I need to explain possibly why. Because I just want to get people the head around, around this. Why do we have problems with it? And it's very simple. We don't like people with control over our lives knowing all about us. We want to use it for useful things. And I have no problem with you having to biometrically prove with a high level of security who you are if you want to get benefits from the government or you want to buy things or enter into a large contract or whatever. What I don't want is a single source, an IPv6 address, which tracks me as I move around the country uniquely and everything I do and links me to all the other... And the reason I say IPv6 is because we can, with there are enough addresses to do everything. Nail down your car, your mobile, your everything. You know, your wallet, your, even the pound notes you touched, if necessary. Well, pound coins. Maybe that's why they've got the new pound coins coming in. Little RFID tags with... Yeah, no, no. Anyone seen... Do you remember The Last Enemy? Anyone seen that little mini-series, The Last Enemy? It's got Benedict Cumberbatch. It's one of his earlier things. Oh, watch it. You'll find it on a sort of catch-up thing, or you, you'll be able to sort of download it from somewhere. 
I'm sure you all know where to go to the right proxies to replace. Uh, so. uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's about how we get around things, which I shouldn't be saying, should I? And that's the problem with the internet and with some of these great ideas. And the problem with this is, you know, I want to be able to do things I want to go. It's about me. And actually, the citizen always wants to be, it's about me. And of course, if you're trying to do good and you're trying to be good, you want to control everybody. But I don't want people knowing when I'm eating too much chocolate. I'm a chocoholic, you know. And I don't want to start telling me how much I can eat. And this is why I'm here, you see. This is a very quick thing, common law. We, we live in a common law country, just. They were getting so much statute driven, we were being told what we can and can't do. In the old days, you could do what you wanted, as long as it wasn't beyond the boundaries. That was a common law, it's limits to behaviour. And the whole point is, you've got over there the state, the monarch, the prime minister, the civil service, telling the people what to do. And they can control their lives to a large extent. Which is why over here, Magna Carta started to set it up. We had the legislature setting the rules under which they can operate. And that's what I'm doing in Parliament, which is why I'm questioning half the time being the grit that's meaning it's not so easy, unfortunately, for people to do everything they want about controlling our lives. Because I think of the Stasi every time. The church used to have a lot of control, but actually that's what we should be doing. We should be thinking in principles and ethics and morality. And the trouble is we've lost that. And it make life easier. Anyway, the point about what I want to rattle onto quickly is about people, not tokens. And it's very interesting because America went the token route. NSTIC's all about trusting the, the token, how you can prove someone is, etc. It's not thinking about the enrollment. Can I trust you? What trust and identity is about is, can I do business with you? And to do that, I think you've got to meet people. Hospitality, you've got to eyeball them. There will always be a need to meet people. Sometimes you can do it on a personal recommendation. I can say to someone, you know, I know, um, take the other Gibson, Ed Gibson terribly well, you know, and um, he's a good man, etc. and you might believe it or not. Box ticking won't work. That's the problem. The box ticking allows the bad guys to get in. And that's the danger is when we get onto too many processes and procedures and stuff, it'll break down. And I just put the CRB, what's a CRB check tell you about someone? You know, we rely on them now. What? Absolutely. Chris got it right in one. They haven't been caught yet. That's all. And the other trouble is if it fails it, it could be the wrong person. That happens regularly. Um, what I want to do with ID is I want to make assertions to get the right things. We get rid of it. But the thing, next thing I put there is very, very important. This my day, it's my day, it's my rules. And the reason is... I haven't got time to go into it, but the Internet of Things is coming along. That's going to be aggregating huge amounts of data. It's aggregating to the government data. You're going to be able to aggregate all this stuff. And if we're not careful, you're going to lose all your privacy, all your control over your lives, all the stuff. And that's what I'm worrying about. Adrian Seckham's here, and he'll give you a lecture on agency, about having the power to control the release of your information to other people, having control over your information. And I've been working with iHub, which is a, um, a, um, a, a, an Internet of Things TSB funded, um, Technology Strategy Board funded thing, looking at information sharing hubs for the Internet of Things where you can actually have policy driven and policy about what's released to and where and everywhere. And that's where we need to be thinking ahead. And I know it's slightly off the point of what you were talking about, but it's all, it's all going to get in there. It's all going to be rolled there because that's going to be an attack vector for you because suddenly your house is going to tell everyone where you're, when you're not there and when you're at work. You know, all sorts of things like that are going to happen. Your dog walking down the street is going to tell someone that you just left the house temporarily to walk it. And all of some things that don't appear to be personal data actually suddenly tied up and aggregated do become it. And I think I'm about to have to shut up. So I'm just going to say one of the things about the cell identity thing is who carries the can. It's all about liability and stuff like that, which is why we always end up trying to use a passport because they've got sovereign immunity and you can't sue the government for it. Um, which is why none of the banks people will do it properly, and the government won't pay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, that's things to think through. I just left it up there. It's from a previous thing about all the ways about trying to do one-way identity and things like that. There's lots of things we can do with it if you want to study it, and things that don't mean that you have to reveal who you are to everybody all the time, which is thing. And the great, this whole thing about commercial organising, tons of stuff on you. Does it therefore matter? Well. It, do, it, can, it doesn't in some ways, and it does in others. It's when it gets aggregated, it's going to be interesting. It's this whole thing about privacy at the bottom. And privacy is in that National Cybersecurity Strategy document. It, you know, they are aware that citizens need privacy. So it's in there as well. But I'm afraid my final thought really is, you know, um, it's an illusion, really. You're never going to be secure. There have been bad guys throughout the ages. They still burglar our houses, and we've been doing something about that for I don't know how many centuries. And whatever we do, 
You've got to look after number one. You've got to look out for yourself. And it's very difficult now because the con men are getting better recently. And, um, and girls. I shouldn't be sexist about this. <laughs> In fact, men... Oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I just want to be free and have a good time. That's my trouble. <laughs>